Good evening. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Yvonne Valencourt. I am the director of the Nantucket Field Station. We are an entity of UMass Boston managed by the School for the Environment. We sit on about 100 acres of conservation land owned by the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. And we run summer courses and we support a lot of researchers and students doing research on the island, both from the UMass system and outside of the UMass system. Um, it is my true pleasure this uh, evening to introduce our seminar speaker, Professor Juanita Urban Rich. Uh, Juanita joins us from UMass Boston. She is a professor of uh, zooplankton ecology and more recently has been working on microplastics. Uh, Juanita is also our um, graduate program director for uh, the marine um, environmental sciences and marine um, science technology programs. Uh, so as much as I'd like to keep talking about Juanita, we've been working together um, on establishing a baseline on Nantucket. Uh, we are very grateful for Remain Nantucket for funding us um, through the DPW and to Graham Darovich and uh, Rob McNeil uh, from the DPW, as well as uh, more recently Emily Molden and RJ from the Land Council for also um, supporting us. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to hand the reins over to Juanita as she sets up her slides and um, she will take it away. Thank you very much, Yvonne. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight as we talk about microplastics occurrences on Nantucket Island. <clears throat> as Yvonne said, she and I have been working along with some other people on the island and a bunch of my students on this project for about a year and a half now, maybe a little longer. But I'd like to acknowledge some of my students who have been very helpful at collecting samples and helping to process them. They include Jack Parkowski, Shannon Hogan, Julianne Darno, and Maeve Arthur. Um, also, as Yvonne mentioned, Graham Durbic from Department of Public Works has been helpful and is a member of this project along with Stephanie Wood from UMass Boston, who's been helping with some of the seal work. So plastics, as you know, <clears throat> occur everywhere. They're a part of our life. <clears throat> and almost everything we do every day involves touching plastic in some way. So right now, as I'm giving this talk to you, I'm touching my mouse, I'm touching my computer that has plastic. And this larger macroplastic that surrounds us and is a part of our life, we know, we've seen the pictures, that it can be damaging to large animals. It can strangle them, it can cut, cut them, it can give them full stomachs where they end up starving because they can't eat other food. And globally now, we're producing over 300 million tons of plastic each year. And it, 2015, it was estimated that about 8 million tons enters the ocean each year. So <clears throat> that was five years ago. So presumably now there is even more plastic entering the ocean. But this is our large macroplastic. And what I want to focus on tonight is the microplastic. These are small plastic particles that are less than five millimeters. <clears throat> And the question is really, what are these tiny little plastics doing? And where do they come from? So before we get into everywhere they come from, I want to go over a couple terms. Microplastics can be categorized as primary microplastics or secondary. Primary microplastics are plastics that are created in industry in that less than five millimeter size class for an application like toothpaste or facial scrubs or 
<clears throat> they are created as little nurdles, which are little pellets that are shipped off to other industries to be melted down and formed into plastic bottles, lampshades, computer screens, whatever other plastic need that uh, the industry is creating them for. The other type of plastic is secondary microplastics. These are ones that form from larger plastic objects through wear and tear. <clears throat> uh, it can be just abrasion, it can be UV oxidation and sunlight breaking them down over time. There are a lot of microplastics that make it into the world's oceans. And if microplastic is created by man in industry or plastic is, how does it get from the industry and from our everyday use into the ocean? The study in Norway found that in the coastal waters around Norway, that the majority of the microplastics actually came from the wear and tear of car tires. Um, a large part also came from the painting and maintenance of ships and boats. Also from the loss and breakdown of plastic bottles. And again, paint, maintenance and construction projects, painting of roads, painting of houses, all of that is another source. And a really big source that all of us contribute to is the washing of our clothes. So many of us wear synthetic clothing. And as we wash it, um, fibers come off and get put in the rinse water and push out into our septic systems into um, the sewer system. Mismanagement of waste treatment is another big source of plastic to the environment. However, another really important source is dust. <clears throat> so whether it's dust in your home, as you're unscrewing the top from a bottle, you break off a tiny little fiber, um, Again, just the clothes you're wearing, the sh shoes you're walking on in the house, you create little plastic particles and dust. It'll blow out the window, we sweep it up, we put it in the garbage, it blows away. So there's a lot of microplastics that get transported atmospherically through these dust particles. Um, and again, depending upon what country you're from and livelihoods or what area, different sources of these may be your primary source of the microplastic. There's other ways that we can categorize and think about microplastics. So not only from what application did they come from or source, we can describe microplastics by what they look like. Are they films, that means they usually can't break down from plastic bags. Are they fibers coming from our clothing, coming from ropes, coming from fishing line? Are they rigid fragments? This is what usually forms from your water bottles and it's from your uh, solo cups and things like that. Or are they more rounded or pellet shaped? Again, some of this is just wear and tear over time, but this is also what is produced in industry to be shipped. We can also categorize microplastics by what they're composed of chemically. So are they polyester? Are they nylon? Are they polypropylene? All of these different ways of looking at and categorizing microplastic um, are important but it also makes the study of microplastic a little bit tricky. So the question comes, who ingests and interacts with these microplastics? And are all microplastics equal? <clears throat> so some of who ingest your microplastics are your zooplankton. These are your little copepods. These are your clam larvae. Th these are your octopus larvae, all of these 
the young of almost everything in the ocean at one time is a zooplankton. Then there are things that live their whole life as zooplankton. These are your what are known as holoplankton, like your jellyfish, like your selps, like your krill. All of these guys interact with your plastic, as do suspension feeders, like oysters, like scallops, like barnacles or corals. You also have filter feeders, things like baleen whales, baleen sharks, your selps, and your appendicularians that can interact with and ingest the plastic. You also get things like deposit and detritus feeders, your crabs, your lobsters, uh, your, your worms living down in the benthos mud. Once it gets into an animal, it has the potential to be passed up through the food web to larger animals like fish or marine mammals or even all the way up to humans. So if a microplastic gets ingested by an organism, what does it matter? It turns out that it's been estimated that humans can ingest or consume either through inhalation or through ingestion, 74,000 to over 120,000 pieces of plastic in a year. Some of this comes from the water we drink, the air we breathe, the food we eat. Again, this is early research. Um, some of these are based only on one study and need to be replicated before we truly understand how much could reach it in all the way up the food web to humans. But whether it's a human or whether it's a little copepod, what does it mean if that microplastic gets ingested? What do these microplastics do to an organism. They can have impacts all the way down at that subcellular level. So if you have some of your smallest uh, microplastics coming into the cell, they can actually change gene expression. They may affect the sex determination of certain organisms. They can change enzyme activity. It can move up then to a cellular level where the Microplastic might impact oxidative stress or inflammation. From the cellular level, you can have impacts all the way up at that individual level. So you might reduce the fecundity or the fertility of an organism. You could reduce its growth. You might change its energy use. So all of us consume food and those calories that we consume get used for respiration, metabolism, growth. So depending upon what we eat, we have different energy that we can use for different uh, processes that we need to survive. If we're feeding on plastic, we can't really digest that and that doesn't give us energy that we can use towards growth. You can also get changes in your behavior as an individual that might affect your survival. An individual is always part of a larger population. And so you can end up having population effects by if enough individuals are being affected. So these lead to altered behaviors of whole populations, um, potentially changes in the male-female ratio, so the population structure. They can also potentially lead to altered habitats, especially for things like corals or oysters that make our foundation species that create habitats for other organisms. So the question comes, how do microplastics do all these things? They can do it physically, um, again, you've got this solid object that you're ingesting in and it can fill up the gut so that there's no room for other food. 
it can cut or tear part of the digestive tract. Those fibers might wrap around the gill structure. Um, so those are all potentially physical ways that microplastic can impact the organism. Biologically, a lot of microplastics get biofilms. So biofilms are bacteria that are land on the plastic, start growing and, and living in that surface. And you might in the ocean also get other microorganisms that settle on that plastic. When that plastic gets ingested, all of those organism microbes that are living on the plastic also get ingested. So you have the potential to transport in bacteria into the gut of the animal. Sometimes these are harmful bacteria that can cause diseases and other problems for the um, animal that ingested the plastic. Chemically, plastic can also impact animals. So plastic itself is just a cocktail of a whole bunch of different compounds. So you got your polyester, but you've also added um, maybe some flame retardants to it. Maybe you've added something to give it more, uh, more rigid structure or make it more soft and bendable. So you have all of these different chemicals within the plastic itself that have the potential to leach out into the organism once it's ingested. However, plastic also acts like a sponge. So a lot of the pollutants that are in the water will come and stick to that plastic. And again, then when the plastic gets ingested, it the plastic is a vector transporting the pollutants inside the organism. So what does it matter when we ingest these? We've talked a little bit about it, but I wanna go over them in a few more details and give you a some examples. So if you ingest that plastic, this is a study that I was involved in where we were looking at corals, temperate corals that grow around here. Um, and it turns out that the coral actually preferred the plastic to the brine shrimp that it should have been feeding on. So it changed its food selectivity. It caused it to have reduced feeding. So it kind of gave it that full gut feeling where it no longer wanted to eat as much. So what does this mean? It means that an animal may completely stop feeding, choose to eat the plastic rather than the food that is nutritious for it. It also means that the plastic's gotten inside of an animal and could be potentially transferred through the trophic uh, food web and up the food web to a larger animal. Again, ingestion of plastic can lead to physiological changes in the organism. In these studies with two of my graduate students, um, in this case, base scallop larvae were fed small uh, polystyrene beads that had gem fibrosol, which is a pharmaceutical attached to it. And what we found was there was a change in the lipid concentration in the animal. So the amount of energy that it uh, kept as reserves changed when it um, had the polystyrene plus the gem on it. So it was significantly less stayed in the larvae over a seven week grow out period. Um, we also found that when oyster larvae ingested microfibers, polyester microfibers, that they had a decreased survival. So again, implications from this is that animals may die, but they may not die completely, but they may not feed at the same rate, so they may grow slower which 
ends up making an animal more susceptible to disease. It's going to be, in the case of bivalves, it's going to be smaller when it settles as an adult, so it's not necessarily going to grow to be as large of an adult. Um, and also the animals may end up with developmental issues. Um, also the ingestion of plastic, a lot of animals ingest it, we know that. A lot of them poop it right back out. It doesn't seem to stay within the animal. So the plastic gets ingested, put back into the fecal pellets, or into pseudo feces in the case of some of the bivalves. All great, doesn't hurt the animal that it was ingesting it. However, having plastic in that fecal pellet means that that fecal pellet is suddenly more buoyant and is not going to sink down to the sediment. You might say, why does that matter? But that decrease in density, increasing fragments, leads to decreased carbon export. So in terms of climate uh, control and the whole carbon cycle, we want to export carbon sometimes from the surface down to deeper waters in the ocean and down to the sediments. If your fecal pellets are too buoyant, they're not going to reach down to the bottom before they're decayed. It also concentrates that plastic in a particle that is consumed by suspension or detritus feeders. So it gives a higher carbon or plastic dose to those animals. Additionally, sometimes ingesting the plastic again may change the behavior of the animals. Um, in this one study here that was found with um, Clem larvae here, when they ingested the polystyrene microplastics, what it was found, so here's the little plastic dots here in the red, uh, the larvae when they had it, um, they ha kept swimming. They weren't able to settle back down. And so they energetically were constantly moving and so um, burning off any energy and they were also kept higher in the water column where they were preyed on by um, animals, more other fish and things like that that were in the water. So the chain, the addition of plastic increased their buoyancy and changed their swimming. Uh, fish have been found when they ingest the microplastics to have reduced swimming rates. So their average speed decreased with the more microplastics that were present. So again, these changes in behavior um, lead to animals becoming more vulnerable to other pre predators, the loss of energy, and ultimately growing slower and being smaller um, adults. As I said, plastic is this chemical cocktail of a lot of different uh, compounds from plasticizers to flame retardants to dyes to all these adsorbed pollutants. These can leach out of the animal or leach off the plastic into the animal once it's been ingested, leading sometimes to um, mortality and lower survival rates. Uh, additionally, um, it can also lead to changes in your sex determination we found for like polystyrene. It's an endocrine disruptor and so can cause problems in that regard. Biologically, I'd said that plastic could be an issue with the biofilms that form on there. So you get diseases <clears throat> that are potentially there. You're potentially changing the gut microbial 
distribution in organisms. So in this case, this is looking at corals, again, looking at some vibrio species um, being present and sloughing off the coral. In these red ones, you see it here, it's stained. The vibrio has been on the plastic and is in, um, once the coral ingests the plastic, the bacteria slough off into the gut. Um, again, this can potentially lead to diseases or to, which could potentially cause the animal to die or at least get sick. And then lastly, you get that trophic transfer or potential bioaccumulation where you got the little copepod that eats the plastic and then the fish eat it and it moves all the way up potentially to our larger marine mammals or to humans. And chemicals and pollutants have the potential to be passed along with these microplastics. Again, most of our understanding of the impacts of microplastic have been done in laboratory studies where we're using higher concentrations than are found in the environment. So everything that I've just gone over are things that we know can happen and be caused by plastic ingestion. However, where the field of science is at right now is trying to understand, do these things happen at current environmental concentrations? Or when in the future will they occur if plastic production keeps increasing the way it is right now? So these are all potential impacts of it. And so here on Nantucket, the sea, the ocean is really an important part of your life. And so we want to understand how much microplastic is around. Where is it? And what organisms or what uh, sphere is the microplastic found in the greatest. So Yvonne and I, uh, along with the help of many other people on the island, have been trying to get a baseline and understand how much microplastic is present in the beach, in the water, in some of the important organisms on, in and around the island. So this baseline study that started in 2019, we had uh, three sites that we were sampling at, Surfside, uh, Nantucket Harbor at the public boat dock area, and out here at Matacat uh, Harbor. We were sampling the beach sand in between the high tide and the low tide. We took samples of the water using a water grab method. We also towed a net tow to try to see if we could determine if any was present in the plankton or if there were larger pieces present in the water that we're not collecting with the water grab sample. We also looked at and collected a few oysters and, and bay scallops to see if the microplastic was present in either of these suspension feeders. Working with Stephanie, we also took samples out here at Great Point where we were looking at um, seal scat. So this is a haul out area for the uh, North Atlantic gray seal. And we were collecting seal scat and sand samples there to see if microplastics was making it all the way up into this larger important marine mammal. The objective of this study was try to determine if microplastics were present and if they were, how many are there? Are they being ingested or passed through the food web? And does the time of the year matter a little bit or how does it change throughout the year? And again, this is forming a baseline and so was some of the first initial information. Now we said this, we started collecting samples in 2019, then 2020 came and COVID came 
And so it's slowed a little bit of this study. So I'll show you what we have to date, um, but there's more to come to this whole story. So we sampled in July and November of 2019 and May and September of 2020. Looking at the macroplastics, so we also collected the macroplastic on the beach from that uh, storm surge wreck line all the way down to the low water line. And looking at our force uh, times that we went out and sampled, July and November of 2019, May and September of 2020, we found that there was sometimes very little, like two pieces of macroplastic, all the way up to um, almost 70 pieces of microplastic in this about 200 square meter area that we were sampling in. And generally speaking, Surfside had the highest concentration of macroplastic, though um, Nantucket Harbor was very high here in the springtime in May with Matacat tending to have the lowest concentration. Types of large macroplastic we found were bags, ropes, gloves, uh, cups, fishing gear, tennis balls, um, lots of different things. If we look at further at that macroplastic, because a lot of the macroplastic is going to get broken down into that microplastic through weathering, through wave action and rolling against the sand and the rocks, um, through animal activity. So what we see, I'm not going to go into everything, but the main point here is that if you look within a certain uh, beach area, so whether you're looking at Matacat, Surfside, or Nantucket Harbor, the type of plastic changes um, in the different sampling times. And generally speaking, just like Surfside had the most, it tends to have the greatest diversity of plastic present. And then, the different sites are also different from each other. Though some of the most common types of plastic are going to be some of your rope and foam fragments. And let's see what's green here. And some bottles and bags tend to be some of your most common types of plastic. If we look at what's present in one liter of water, um, this is results right now just from the July 2019 and November 2019 samples. What we see is that concentrations range from one mic, or actually zero at Surfside in November, zero microplastics per liter, all the way up to six pieces of plastic per liter for water. These are fairly typical concentrations for around here. Abbey Barrows in Maine has found the average concentration of microplastic in the Gulf of Maine was seven. So here in these samples, we're a little bit lower that, than that, but we're seeing the variability that can occur. Uh, we've just worked out the method for looking at the sand samples. And so for looking at one sample, so what we did for the beach sand is we did a 100 meter transect along the beach and we had these quarter meter square uh, grids that we sampled the top two inches of sand. We dried the sand completely, and then we've analyzed all of that sand to see how many microplastics were present in it. Um, to date, we only have one sample counted right now um, from one small grid in Matacat in July. 
And there we found 167 microplastic pieces per kilogram of sand. Again, this is in the ballpark range, um, kind of high for a lot of areas along the east coast of the United States. These were a few of the larger pieces of plastic that we also found in that sample. Looking then at some of the seal scat, <coughs> um, this was work that Jack did as part of his honors thesis. What we found was fibers were very, very common. You'll see this blue fiber here, another blue fiber over here. Fibers were found in every single sea, seal scat that we looked at. Larger plastic fragments, or in this case, a microbead, were found in four out of nine uh, samples, so about 44% of the seal scats that were examined had some larger um, pieces of plastic in them. Again, a seal by itself is not going to be able to eat a microplastic. It's too small. So it suggests that the plastic is being transferred through the food web to get to this larger marine mammal. Um, this is preliminary work right now uh, with looking at the oysters that we collected in Nantucket Harbor in July 2019. This is looking at, uh, here it's showing total microparticle concentrations. So it's microplastics plus some organic fibers. So we're finding anywhere from 35 all the way up to 152 microparticles per oyster. The blue and the yellow represent the microplastic. The blue is a microfiber and the yellow represents those particles, whether they're fragments or films. Um, and so you see that the majority of what is in the oyster are fibers. Now this is looking at the whole oyster, including its pseudofeces. Um, so again, when we eat a raw oyster, we're pulling it out of its shell and we sometimes we'll also get those pseudofeces. So this is everything. It's not, does not reflect what is actually ingested. Um, we're hoping to get to that part in, in the next month to actually see how much of these total microplastics particles actually get ingested by the oyster. So where do we go from here? Um, first, we want to finish processing all the samples that we have to really understand how much is present in that beach sand and is it different between the harbor, Matacat, and Surfside? Those three places have very different uses. Um, Surfside has, is a big beach area in the summertime. It's also open to the Atlantic, so has much higher wave activity. Mattaket has a lot of boats moored there and <laughs> is a much calmer area. Nantucket Harbor in the public docks area, again, right there by town where you have a lot of people present. Um, the main harbor where boats are coming in and out of. So different potential sources and inputs to these three locations, as well as out at Great Point, um, which again is more of a reserve area and is not impacted quite as much. So we also want to learn what type of microplastic is present. Is it polyesters? Is it nylon? What type is there? And we want to try to continue and expand the study to better understand how microplastics may impact Nantucket Island, all the way from the littlest animal all the way up to the people. And right now, I'd like to take a minute to try to compare this little bit that we know from Nantucket to some of the other areas that I've been doing some 
uh, microplastic work in. So one of my students is doing her work on Boston Harbor. And what we see with just microfibers is that concentrations range anywhere from one to 45 microfibers per liter. Nantucket, you are ranging from zero to six. So generally speaking, you're much lower concentrations than what we had here in the harbor. But that's also at the very surface of the water in Boston Harbor. If we look at biologically relevant depths in the harbor, more similar to the same depth that we were sampling in Surfside, Mattaquet, and in Nantapaket Harbor, we find that the average concentration is down to seven micro plastics per liter. So much more similar to what you're finding out there in Nantucket. So there's a lot floating right there on the surface. It decreases rapidly. Is that from consumption? Is it from being exported and transported? I don't know at this point in time. Um, within Boston Harbor, most of the things tended to be polyester. So on Nantucket, we found microplastics in the seals and in the oysters. Um, some other work we've done along Massachusetts, we've found that microplastics are in a lot of the copepods, uh, various polychaete worms, barnacle noplii, and in cladocerins. About one in three animals ha will have some microplastic in them. Um, oyster concentrations in Boston Harbor are very similar to that found in Nantucket, going from about five all the way up to 160. Hmm. Helps if I hit this the right way. Um, also, looking at um, Estrangia, which is a temperate coral in Narragansett Bay, we found microplastics within the coral polyps at fairly high concentrations. And as I said, we found them in the seals on Nantucket. So what does it ma matter that we're doing this, that we find this? Um, what it means is it's going into all of these different types of animals, whether you're a pelagic animal, whether you're a larvae, whether you're an adult, whether you're a mammal or a foundation species. The microplastic is making it into a range of animals within the ocean and in our coastal waters. And so in the end, the question comes, what does it matter to these animals? We don't know, but we'd like to know. And we'd like to not have these animals have to eat the plastic. So all of us can try to decrease our plastic use by just recycling, using single use to try to decrease how much is there. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much for Remain Nantucket for funding the Nantucket work. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Juanita. Um, we do have some questions that are coming in through the chat box. Um, so for those of you tuning in, um, please do continue to type in comments and questions. Um, the, uh, another um, comment that came up was, um, can we post some references in particular for bivalves um, at some sure. point after this talk um, so for Valerie Hall, uh, who's a local scholar researcher. Uh, Mary Longacre would like to know, are there regulations either existing or proposed for the acceptable amount 
of microplastics and items for human consumption? Um, no, <laughs> there are not right now. Um, in part, we really, again, don't know the impacts. We don't know what concentration is going to be a problem for people. The very first studies are being done just in the last couple years where we found out that microplastics are in food and, and drinks that we consume. Um, so at this point, no, we don't have that. I'm sure it will be coming at some point. I had a few um, questions and comments, um, sure. or, or questions really. Uh, so you you were talking a lot about oysters. Um, you know, of course, we we eat oysters, so that's concerning. Um, I know with scallops, we are just eating the muscle, and so is, what's the difference there? And um, if if it's largely in the pseudo feces in oysters, if you don't ingest the pseudo feces, so if you're just eating the entire oyster, I, I guess my question is, uh, what are our concerns? That's a great question, and it's one that I we hope we can answer better when we finish processing all the samples. So at this point in time, we've looked at the whole oyster. What we're doing now, and actually one of my students was working on it today, was she was cutting out part of the digestive tract of the oyster and just seeing what part, how many actually make it into the oyster. So, which will give us a better feeling for how many we could ingest. So it, if when we take that oyster out of the half shell, if we rinse it off and get rid of any pseudo feces, then we would be consuming a lot less, presumably. Um, and most studies that have been done already to date are finding pretty low concentrations in oysters, um, anywhere from zero to about 10 pieces of plastic per oyster. Um, so I do think it can be potentially a lot less that we're consuming. Um, all of the bivalves have slightly different ways that they feed. And what um, Evan Ward down in Connecticut has found is that oysters are actually able to reject some types of plastic and not ingest them. That was actually a, another question. Um, that's mm -hmm. come up. Uh, is there a preference for the types of plastics that bivalves or other things that you've um, that you're you've read about or worked with? Um, so, are is there a preferential uptake of particular types or shapes? So, fibers versus the spheres. Um, and also the distribution in the water column. Um, do you tend to find one type of plastic in one region of the water column or the benthos more than the others? Um, all really interesting questions. Let's try to take them one at a time. Um, so again, based a lot on Evan Ward's work in Connecticut, um, he has found, at least with oysters, that like nylon is rejected more than, I believe, the polystyrene that he was looking at. Um, mussels didn't seem to be as picky, like they would take both. Um, very few people in the, have really done a study yet to try and see if there's a preference by animals to one type of plastic or another. Um, we know like corals prefer plastic to some of their natural food, whether they're 
picking up on some of the chemicals leaching from it and they think, oh, this smells or tastes sweet, I don't know, um, but they will preferentially ingest it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of distribution in the water column, there is going to be some. So plastics have a whole range of densities. Some of them are less dense in seawater and so will unless they get a biofilm, are going to be floating on the surface. Some of your plastics, PVCs, are much denser and so will tend to sink down. I think it also depends a little bit of how they're being input into the water um, and the depth that they're being injected or put in, which affects their distribution. Um, so yes, we do find a little bit of variability with depth. Um, I don't, for the samples that we took out at Nantucket, we were just taking like uh, six inches or so below the surface water and a little bit further down. So six inches to a foot below the water. Um, so we don't really have a good distribution there of the different types. We have um, another question from Mary mm -hmm. Longacre. Are there any foods you would call high risk with microplastics for human consumption? Sort of a, a anything similar to um, how we consider heavy metals a risk in fish. Right. Um, right now, from some work done in Europe, again, your shellfish probably have your highest concentrations of microplastics compared to fish or um, other seafood. But the reality is, in terms of ingestion, you're probably getting more microplastics from some of the water that you're drinking or just breathing it in through the air than what you're going to ingest through your food right now. That kind of brings up another question. What is the most common uh, type of microplastic and um, what is sort of the most, I don't want to say the most toxic, but the most uh, risky thing that's out there right now that, that you think the most, uh, the biggest concern we have? So those are two questions. But... So the most common type of plastic is polyester. Um, it's by far the most abundant type of plastic produced. Um, especially if you think the majority of plastics in the ocean or in the environment tend to be fibers. So they a lot of times are coming from our clothes or from various ropes and things like that. Um, so polyester is the most abundant. What is the most dangerous? I don't know, and that's a really tricky question because there's so many additives that are added to different types of plastic depending upon its use that it's hard to say what's the most dangerous. Um, is a certain type of shape more dangerous than another? Maybe. Uh, maybe some, some of those more rigid fragments might be more dangerous than foam. But um, I, I don't think there's been any studies done to verify any of that yet. Well, it's almost 7 o'clock. Um, sure. I could keep throwing questions. <laughs> such an interesting um, topic uh, and there are um, so many 
things to uh, continue to get into. And it, I know that it's a um, emerging area and that people are currently, you know, trying to um, establish what's just in the environment, which is what we're doing here largely is uh, figuring out what our, our natural, well, what our existing baseline is. Well, what is it that we have here? Um, and so I'm sure there'll be a lot more studies coming out, but it, it's an interesting time. Um, one last thing I wanted to bring up as I listened to this, um, the idea that plastics can also attract and hold on to compounds, um, maybe some way forward uh, might be for somebody to engineer the capacity to remediate things that are in the water using plastic, but then pulling the plastic out. Um, of course, that's very far from what we're doing, but it struck me that that could be useful in some way. It could be. And I don't know, there might be a way, even with water treatment, I don't know, this gets beyond my knowledge area and I can speculate, but uh, potentially you could run water through some sites of plastic to pull out chemicals, things especially that are at low concentrations, but that are dangerous to have. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, again, I, I could keep asking. I know um, one thing that you're expanding is um, the idea of collecting precipitation and in, in wind-based um, microplastics. So that'll be really exciting. And I, I do look forward to um, a time when we can um, show more results of what, what we have. Um, when we process those. Um, so I would like to uh, thank you. I'm holding out to see if there's any more comments, but I don't see any. So um, I think this would probably be a good time to wrap up. And I really appreciate that you've taken the time to talk to us and to um, go over the larger picture as well. It's interesting to see the comparisons um, to the work in Boston and to hear about things you know, further up in Maine as well. Um, it's a really um, concerning thing to think about. And so I really appreciate it. Thank you, Juanita. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing you down here soon to-, to Yeah, that would be great. Oh, hold on, we've got a couple. Oh yeah, Emily Molden piped in to say thank you. Um, so thank you, Emily for tuning in as well. And yeah, we'll see you soon. All right, thank you so much. I was glad to be able to do this. Thank you.